Hi, so we will discuss clipping and culling algorithms today in the forward rendering pipeline of computer graphics. Uh, and we have a set of slides for that. Yes, okay. So now let's talk about uh, clipping and culling. So we uh, remember the rendering pipeline, the forward version, the backward rendering pipeline is about ray casting and ray tracing, uh, where you send rays from camera to the scene and use some intersection of ray versus scene objects, and then uh, pull back the colors from the scene to the uh, image plane using those rays. That is backward because it is not natural. We don't really send rays from our eyes to see it. The more natural way and even the faster way is to get rays from the scene and project it to, to our eye, uh, which brought us to this forward rendering pipeline. And today we will talk about clipping and culling uh, components of this pipeline. Uh, so in this forward pipeline, we have this uh, modeling transformations that bring us from local 3D object coordinates to the 3D world coordinates. And then further viewing transformations take place to move this all the way down to 2D window. Uh, and in particular, we discussed projections here uh, mainly orthographic or perspective uh, that brought us to the canonical volume. And from there, I, we go to the, to the viewport. Okay, so now uh, sequence of operations that is used to draw primitives like triangles making up our 3D models defined in 3D coordinate system here uh, on a 2D window. Uh, and we have some API support uh, for all these actions actually, OpenGL being the most popular one, also direct 3D. Uh, so we don't really calculate all these transformation matrices that bring us from 3D to 2D. We use, uh, we just give some parameters to OpenGL and, uh, or D3D and we get to our 2D viewport. Uh, so here, this is still a recap about the forward rendering pipeline. We have vertices to begin with, and they transform to new positions. And at that uh, position, with their transform positions, uh, they also define some primitives like triangles connecting three vertices, transform three vertices. And those primitive primitives uh, are exposed to this clipping and culling to decide the visible ones. So this is the topic of today, actually, this box. And once visible ones are decided, uh, we, uh, we are still in 3D, by the way, here. Uh, we decide the visible ones, and then we put those visible ones to 2D, along with their Z depth information to uh, to use for further actions. Uh, and in 2D, we have actually a couple of vertices, uh, a set of vertices. Uh, so not every point in our model is a vertex. Three vertex define a triangle and the rasterization uh, interpolates the colors on or other values in those three vertices and uh, interpolates them within the triangle, the primitive. So it creates the pixels that land inside the triangle of those three uh, transformed vertices. So it does this for each triangle separately. So it produces pixels, the rasterization that we will see next week, it produces the pixels, which are also known as fragments. And then we decide on their colors uh, again. We use some fragment shaders to do that. Yeah, so this is also summarizing what I said 
That's why I'm skipping this. Uh, so we have done transformations. The green boxes are covered already in this class, in this course. Uh, namely, we have moved the model to from the local 3D model coordinates to world coordinates, and then from there to camera coordinates, and then from there to the uh, to the uh, viewport. Uh, primitive assembly, this part uh, is not really covered, but there is really nothing to cover here. So it is just given to you. It says that make these uh, three vertices, three corners of a triangle, and that triangle is your primitive. Clipping and culling is covered today. Uh, and also rasterization, the interpolation of uh, primitive values within that primitive will be done later. Uh, and that primitive can also be aligned, by the way. In that case, uh, the input will be just two endpoints, not three triangle points, but two line endpoints. But you will still do interpolation to create the other points of the line. So these are all the tasks of your rasterizer. Uh, and also fragments, pixel coloring. So it says yet to come, but actually we have covered this fragment shaders, etc. before, uh, when we have done GLSL programming, uh, actually in the previous week, if I recall correctly. So I pushed it earlier for your homework assignment. Now let's deal with uh, our uh, topic today, start with clipping. So there are essentially three kinds of primitives, triangles, lines and points uh, so if your mesh is a polygon mesh maybe a quad mesh you have quads so it all quads are uh, decomposed into two triangles and any polygon are decomposed into triangles so it is possible so you can consider that regardless of the uh, nature of your input polygon mesh in the end you will have triangle primitives Sometimes you don't really have any mesh around, any surface around. You have a curve made up by lines, then your primitive would be line. And sometimes you won't even have any connectivity information at all, but still you have some content. And that is the very basic content, the points, the atomic units. Uh, you cannot go uh, further than that. You cannot decompose a point. So actually point clipping is straightforward. By the way, clipping is the task of uh, rejecting uh, the invisible parts of the primitive. So if the primitive is point, then it means that it comes with a single coordinate. And if it is outside your viewing volume, then you just reject it completely. So there is nothing to fragment here. There is nothing to segment. Uh, you just reject it all. Line clipping, however, not like that. Maybe some part of a line is in your visible volume. Uh, then you have to get that segment. Uh, and polygon clipping is similar. Maybe some part of the polygon is within the weaving volume. Then you have to clap that uh, part. Uh, so clipping done. In the 3D clip space, which is a result of applying projection transformation. Remember, uh, orthographic or perspective, it doesn't matter. You have some projection that uh, puts you into your canonical view volume. Uh, and it is a 3D environment. So actually, clipping takes place in this 3D. Uh, place. Uh, so this is that uh, uh, projection matrix, if you recall. Uh, but for simplicity today, I will assume that uh, I will be using a 2D box instead of a 3D box. Uh, and the clipping will take place within this 2D box that's running from X min X max to Y min x min y man, min to x max y max uh, and the same ideas we will see here 
can be generalized to 3D. So the first algorithm to see is this Cohen Sutherland algorithm for line clipping. Again, recall the task. If this is your weaving volume, in this case, weaving area, because I am showing stuff in 2D. If it is inside your weaving area, then you see it completely. If it is outside, you don't see it at all. And if it is partially inside, then you see the part that is inside. So this algorithm is about to create this part and to allow this fully uh, inside perimeter to be seen. We have these two categories, uh, non-trivial cases, we have the green cases and the tri uh, sorry red cases and the trivial uh, cases which are shown in uh, green. So I first need to uh, label my environment. So I will use regions. So if this is my weaving area, I will be needing eight more regions. So in the end, I will have nine regions in total, and I will. Uh, name these regions as follows. So I will assign some binary code to each region. So bit zero, which would be the rightmost bit, is one if this region is to the left of the left edge. So one, 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 left of the left edge. Bit one is this guy. It is uh, one. If this region is to the right of the right, so if you look at this bit from the right, uh, it would be one, as you can see. Bit two would be uh, this uh, uh, bit, third one from the right. Uh, and it would be one if it is below the below bottom edge, so one, one, one. And similarly, bit three, the leftmost bit, would be one if it is above the top edge of your weaving area. Again, if this is a weaving volume, then how many regions would you have? Uh, so it is like a Rubik's cube. Uh, you have this center in the kernel. In the center, you have your weaving volume. And you have eight other guys for that layer, but you have one layer up, one layer down, so nine per layer, you have three layers, you will have 27 uh, regions. And then four bits wouldn't be sufficient because with four bits, you can represent uh, 16 regions at most, um, two to the four. So you need five bits for 3D. But now let's come back to 2D to see the algorithm. So the algorithm comes here actually first, we have these trivial conditions. If both codes are zero, so you have endpoints, obviously it is your input because your line is defined by V0 and V1. Uh, so in this case, V0 and V1. If they are, if the code is both zero, so if you take this line, for instance, this end is zero, this end is zero, so it is trivial except. Nothing to worry about, done. Similarly, your line can be completely at the left side. Then what happens is when you end the code, you will have a non-zero output because uh, if everything is on the left of the left edge, like this line, or even a shorter version, or even this version, so all these three lines, so let, let's take this last one. Endpoints, you will end uh, this value with itself and the output will be one, right? So let me just uh, be perfectly clear. So you end this endpoint with this endpoint, which has the same code. So end of one and one will be one, zero and zero will be zero and zero and zero. So this value you obtain is non-zero. So you trivially reject this. Similarly, let's take the lar largest, longest case here. So this endpoint has this bit representation, whereas this endpoint has this one. So they are different, but 
let's see if their ant will give a one. It must give a one by definition because they both have this bit zero, have the same value of one and one and one is one. So I don't really care about the other bits because in the end, due to this one, I have a non-zero value here. So you will trivially reject all these three lines I have shown you. And with the same logic, those lines can be like horizontal like this uh, or horizontal like this. I am terrible at drawing, but this is a line apparently. Or those lines can again be vertical, but like this or like this or like completely vertical. Yeah, so these are all uh, trivially rejected. Now for the non-trivial case, uh, you will have some iterations to do. You essentially iteratively subdivide your input line into two segments such that one or both segments can be discarded. So V0 to V1, your input, you, uh, you know the intersection point of this line with this uh, V-wing area line, line by line intersection. So this point is known to you. Uh, then you have two segments, this segment versus this segment. This segment is trivially rejected uh, because you just treat this red one, not this uh, dark red one. So it gets rejected. Now you repeat the same recursively or iteratively, uh, but now your input is this brownish, the dark red. So you discard this completely. Here, you take the other intersection point that is on your viewing area edge, one of your viewing area edges. It happens to be this edge at this time. So now this guy, uh, has a code 000 and 000. So you land into this first case. If both codes are zero, then you trivially accept this. So you accept this. And this guy, it just gets rejected uh, trivially because of the end of one and one, this second bit. And this is just for an extra information has nothing to do with this example, but so this, a line like this, for instance, it, it is not a trivial reject because if you look at this endpoint, 0, 1, 0, 0, if you end it uh, with this endpoint, 0, 0, 1, you will have a zero output, right? Zero times zero is zero, zero and one is zero, one and zero is zero, zero and zero is zero. So your output will not be non-zero, then you will not have a trivial reject. So you have to process this in uh, two or three steps, like you have to do some iterations. Although it will be rejected completely in the end, you will waste waste some time to understand that this is uh, a fully rejected line, but not trivially rejected line. So that, that would be the disadvantage. So non-trivial lines can take several iterations to clip. Uh, and the advantage is if the chance of trivial accept and reject are high, it is extremely fast because you look at the endpoints and you perform an end operation on those endpoints. That's it. Uh, and so when does this happen? If your clipping rectangle, your weaving area is very large, then you will have a lot of trivial accepts. You are good. Similarly, if it is very small, then you will have a lot of trivial rejects, so you are still good. Here is a different algorithm uh, that speeds up our trivial Cohen-Sutherland algorithm uh, by getting rid of these iteration stuff. So it uh, puts you to a completely mathematical framework, so you don't have to do any algorithmic uh, algorithmic uh, decisions. Actually, there are some algorithmic decisions of this, but I mean, you don't have to uh, take some iterations to decide on uh, stuff. So this algorithm is about potentially entering and potentially leaving uh, decisions. And there is a 40% speed up over the previous Cohen-Sutherland algorithm. So it's 
it's a significant speed up. So uh, this is your line that can be represented parametrically using the parameter T. Uh, it is a line running from V0 in the direction of V0 to V1 vector. And you go Tm on in this vector where T is your parameter for this line. So actually the idea is this, uh, if this uh, rejective, uh, the enter, so we are entering and leaving. Uh, so we reject the line if the, uh, like this line, starting from here, the time that is for entering will be bigger than the time that is for leaving. Uh, so given the line from V0 to V1, we want to determine the part of the line inside the weaving box or rectangle. Uh, okay, so let's first understand this leaving and entering business more clearly. We have this potentially entering or leaving uh, tags. Uh, so, and these are potential because take this line for instance, V0 to V1, it is potentially entering to your weaving box because this x1 is bigger than this x0 so uh, and this is i am considering the left edge here so with respect to the left edge there is some potential entrance it is potentially because the line can be like this right above so although the x stuff is okay the y stuff is not okay so it will not enter at all that's why it is potentially entering Similarly, V2 to V3 is potentially leaving, right? Because uh, the X of V2 is bigger than the X of V3. Similarly, uh, the situation goes for like this in the right edge. Uh, V4 to V5 is potentially leaving because X4 is smaller than X5, like here or V6 to V7 is potentially entering with respect to the right edge because X6 is bigger than X7. Uh, and similar for bottom and top case, cases. So we have even for, let's also only do this bottom. For, for, for the bottom edge, V0 to V1. So the difference is now I will be controlling the Y coordinates, not the Xs. Uh, with respect from the, point of view of the bottom edge, uh, there is a potential entrance if y0 is less than y1, which is the case here. And similarly, v2 to v3 v line is leaving the weaving area because uh, v2 is higher, bigger than v3. Now, observation, if a line is first leaving and then entering, it can't be visible at all. Like, so let, let this sink in. Uh, if a line is first leaving, like take this line, it is leaving with respect to the bottom, uh, sorry, top uh, edge, like top edge, but this is an infinite line, right? So you extend this line uh, and this line, V0 to V1, first intersects this top edge based line. Uh, and so since this is about top, you will be looking at the Y component. So you will be using this slide. Uh, and what you will do is you will check whether Y0 uh, is bigger than Y1 or not. In this case, it is. So then we have this situation. So if Y0 is was smaller than y1, we were entering, but now it is reversed, so we are leaving. Uh, so this is potentially leaving. Similarly, uh, this is uh, not going to be visible because it first leaves and then enters. So there is entering decision is done based on this left line, left edge of the weaving box. 
and this line is potentially entering because it is not actually entering. That's why we use potentially prefix here. Uh, so with respect to the left edge, it looks like entering, but and it is actually, but it is not due to the height problem. So in the end, we have these two labels, potentially entering part and potentially leaving part of the same line. So I have two features. So I also know the T values that bring me from V0 to this point and V0 to this point. Now, if the T value for leaving is less than the T value for entering, which means that leaving happens before exiting, uh, we, sorry, leaving happens before entering, so it doesn't even sound right, uh, then it can't be visible. This is the algorithm. Uh, that is the idea. Uh, visible lines are first. Uh, okay, so these are for invisible lines. So let, let's repeat the same logic to detect the visible lines. So as the logic dictates, you first need to enter and then leave, right? So these are the good lines that can be visible. So take this line V0 to V1. It intersects one of these one, two, three, four edges. So the, or infinite lines that are passing through these edges. These are the important edges in our life because these are the ones that are defining your viewing uh, area. So among those four edges, it first intersects this left edge based line. Uh, and according to the left edge, this line is entering. Why? Because I look at the X component of zero and X component of one. So X zero versus X one, X zero is less than X one. So I am in yeah. this box, X zero is less than X one. So I am potentially entering. So I am PE. I put this PE along with the T that uh, makes me enter potentially. And later on, I look at the second intersection points uh, for this uh, line. That would be giving me the second label. By the way, there will be two intersecting intersection points uh, in 2D because I have four infinite lines uh, defining my weaving area and I have this query line. It will intersect only two of them. Uh, so if it is parallel, it won't even intersect. But so first I'm talking about the general case. Uh, yeah, so for this case, uh, we have this top edge and top line uh, and top, that's why I will be looking at Y coordinates. So Y0 versus Y1, Y0 is less than Y1. So let's remember that scenario. Y0 is less than Y1, but not with respect to bottom edge. Again, be careful. I need to look with respect to top edge. So it will be y0 or y y smaller y4 less than y5 or y1 the y bigger uh, so i am leaving then i tag this as the leaving point pl point then i look at the t values the time for entering is smaller than the time for leaving so it means that entering happens before leaving which is the logical configuration. So you need to first enter, then leave. Then this is a visible line. This is the intuition and logic of this algorithm. And the rest is about uh, implementation details. Like, uh, first of all, if leaving happens before entering, so T of potential leaving is before or smaller than T of potential entering, then it is not visible at all. So you will not be doing any drawing. Uh, yeah, so I need these T values apparently. These are critical and at intersection points, we need to compute T values as well as whether the line is uh, PE or PL at that point. Uh, yeah, so these are our regular
time uh, line parameterization with t parameter, and these are known coordinates uh, for our leaving area. And based on that, we decide the t values as well as the potential entering or leaving tags, uh, and then. Uh, then we make our decision, for instance, so dx is, by the way, this difference, we call it dx. So for instance, a line like this uh, will not have any x difference because this is completely vertical. There is no slope. So then dx, difference of x's between v0 and v1 start and endpoints will be 0. In that case, it is. Uh, so you just look at, you compare the fixed x min of your viewing area with one of the x's, which are x0 or x1, doesn't matter, they are the same. And you make your easy rejections on these degenerate cases. Other than that, you uh, compute your t and your compute your, decide your classification, pl or pae, and then, uh, so compare your T, uh, essentially you will be comparing the leaving and entering times. If are, they are not consistent, then you reject. Uh, okay, so this is for uh, one dimensional line clipping. I say one dimensional because there is only one parameter. Now we go to 2D, I have a polygon. Uh, but I will not even parameterize it, so it is not really that necessary uh, to talk about the dimension here. Uh, I just say that as the dimension increases, the problem becomes even more difficult. Uh, so the algorithm is, again, Sutherland guy is involved, but now it is part, he is partnered with, not Cohen, but Hodgman for the polygon clipping. I think these all happened in, the University of Utah, uh, where lots of stuff happens for computer graphics there, uh, like teapot, te Utah teapot, etc. So the algorithm is, let's go visual first. You will take all these edges of your viewing area, viewing rectangle, and with respect to this guy, you clip out these spikes, then from the bottom clip out this, then from the left clip out this, and there will be another touch from the top. So in the end, this will be your output. This is your input, this is your output. Um, and you will send this data to your rasterizer to save time. So you will not even be uh, dealing with these uh, clipped out vertices. So, when you do this thing in 3D, uh, uh, so this part will just not be processed for the further 2D actions. That is a beauty of clipping. So the algorithm is actually simple. Uh, so you start, first of all, you need to uh, understand that there is an ordering in a polygon. You need to remember that. Uh, v0, v1, v2, v3. So whatever vertex, whatever number of vertex vertices you have on your polygon, there is an order. So from vi to vi plus one, you can go. That is what I want to say. And for this, starting from vi, it is inside a point, point inside a box test, which is easy to do. You go to the next in order, which is vi plus one. This is also inside. So you also add this point. You add vi as well, since it was inside. Then this is also inside. So you also add vi plus one to the output. Now from this point, you I now name it as vi, and you go to the next item. You see that this is outside. Then you will be computing this intersection point that I call v prime i plus one, and add this one to your result set, but not this one. But for the next iteration, you start from this 
rejected point uh, and go to its next uh, value, which would be VI. This is also outside, so add nothing to the output. Now, next iteration from VI, you go to your next point uh, and you have a transition from out to in, which means you must have an intersection and you put that intersection point to your result set. Now let's uh, talk about this intersection point, V, v prime, I call it just V prime. Uh, so what is V prime? The, it all comes from our good old friend dot products actually. Uh, so there is this uh, point P, I call this P, okay? Instead of V I, V prime I plus one, I will just keep it simple. Uh, so this P point, I reach it by going from V towards W, I call V I V and V I plus one W for simplicity. So as you go from V to W, this vector T amount starting from V. So what is the T then? If you know the T, then you will put this in this equation and it will give you your P. So you will be using two, vectors one vector runs from a a point on your line on your fixed line viewing rectangle line uh, from a to v okay so this is one vector i will be using and the second vector i will be using is again run, uh, running from a to the other end point w now be careful uh, if you look at the uh, dot product, uh, so it, the dot product of this thing will come. Uh, so just remember the dot product of this vector to our normal of line, which is also known, is a positive entity, entry entity, because it's the scalar projection of this line to this unit direction. Similarly, this, so if you even want to see it, it will like project like this, so it will be this length. Similarly, the dot product uh, of this vector to n, by the way, you can even draw n here because a is any point on this line. So let's put a here, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, so, but this dot product will be negative because it falls to the back of this unit vector n. Now, <clears throat> I have this uh, equation to begin with, right? This is the P equation that will uh, bring me to V. I will just subtract the value A from both right and left hand side. So P minus A would be V minus A uh, plus T times this new vector minus <clears throat> this new vector. And now I will use the dot product. <clears throat> so I will dot each vector here <clears throat> with n, <clears throat> uh, so it doesn't uh, change the identity. I have this thing. Now, this is the observation we make. And that <clears throat> a vector from A to P, which would be this vector, the third vector, would be zero by definition, because if P is <clears throat> on the surface, on the line, then its projection to this <coughs> unit direction n would be zero n. Like if you project this here, you will see just zero moment instead of this like bigger moment. Yeah, so then you replace this with zero. Then I think we have another shortcut here. I just use d1 for this uh, long expression plus t times and I will be using V2 for this long expression, minus D1 again. Uh, and from here, I can pull back my T, which is this. Okay, so knowing T, you can now plug it here and get your P. And that P is important because if you recall the algorithm, we will be adding that P to our result set. Uh, so, Couple of questions here. Maybe what if V is on the plane, on, on the line actually? In, three, in 3D, we have a plane representing our weaving volume, but here 
the example is on 2D, I assume. So then what if V is on the line? Uh, so in other words, V is this, remember? So what if your line like starts from here and goes like, so this is V and this is W. So what if that's, then what happens? Uh, what happens is the vector from A to V, okay, this vector, when you dot it, dot it with your normal, it is perpendicular due to the choice of V. Uh, so you will have a zero value. So D1 will be zero. Okay, so that is the answer I am looking for here. D1 will be zero. And what it makes to me, <clears throat> if you plug zero here, zero over something uh, <clears throat> will be zero. So T will be zero. Your P will be then P equal to V plus zero times something zero. So P is zero. So you put the V itself to the output set. Similarly, let's do the second part with a new page. What if W is on the plane? So then it is this configuration. V is this <clears throat> and W stops right on the plane or on the line, not like somewhere in the middle, in the outside region. So this is another degenerate case, but it is not that degenerate actually. So with W here, again, your vector from A to W, again, we write this, this as W minus A. So when you say A to W, uh, expression will be the last thing you say W comes to the beginning minus the first thing you say. So this vector is that, and it is perpendicular to your normal direction and its color projection to this unit direction n will be zero. So this D2 will be zero. Making D2 zero, what does it give? So this part will be zero. So D1 over D1 is one. So your time parameter will be one, which makes what? If T is one, then your P would just be equal to W because we cancel out naturally. So it is again logical. So in, this, in that case, we will be adding this point as your V bar, V prime, as your P point to your result set as mentioned here. So now let's put all these things in action and complete the algorithm. Now that I know my P locations easily, I can know it. So let's see this weaving box on only one part is seen but it is like a box like this uh, minus the spikes here or it is even not a box it is an area but whatever uh, so you process your polygon starting from the first vertex in go to the next it is in so put it to the inbox then from here p2 to p3 so I have a situation going from in to out. So I will put the P point, like I calculated before. But the trick is you repeat it because P2 prime is kind of inside as well as outside. So then it makes more sense. With P2 prime on in and out categories, I continue. Now I process P2 to P3, so I am at P3 to P4. They are both out, so they just come in. Now P4 to P5 will lead to another intersection point called P4 bar, P4 prime. And again, whenever you have an intersection point, you just duplicate, rip, uh, make a, put uh, two copies into both sets, both in and out, and P5 was in. Uh, and then this is the last uh, vertex in your polygon, you know it, uh, so you don't do the other uh, line even. And the output will be this actually, just follow everything in the inbox, in the in uh, column, not the out. And if you see it here, it will move you from P2, P1 to P2, then to P2 prime, then to P4 prime, then to P5. 
okay, P1, P2, P2 prime, P4 prime, P5. So that would be the new polygon that I will be using. So this is also a polygon, by the way, an ordered set of vertices running from one to two bar, four bar, and five. Yeah, so you can then rename it like one, two, three, four, five, whatever. But this is the polygon, uh, clipped polygon uh, after this algorithm. So this is this completes our clipping discussion uh, about culling. These are similar concepts, but culling is about uh, deciding the completely entirely outside objects and getting rid of them. Uh, so complex scenes contains many objects, objects closer to the, and there is also other culling types like there may be other stuff in front of you, then you get called out. Etc. At least some part of you gets called out, gets called. Uh, rendering time can be saved if these invisible parts, due to not being in the view for us, or due to uh, being occluded by another thing, uh, or due to being facing to the opposite direction of the view vector. So there, there are cases we will see, actually they, these are listed here, like three common calling strategies are, if an object is outside of your viewing area or viewing box, viewing volume, then we have this viewing, view volume calling, it goes away. If some primitives of your object uh, are back facing, like uh, their uh, front face, cannot be seen by the camera, then you don't really have to put a color on that front face because you will not be seeing that anyway. So you eliminate those back faces. We call them back faces. So we don't even draw the front faces of those primitives. And occlusion calling is about uh, someone is in front of you. So that uh, some part of you then will not be visible due to the guy who is in front of you. So let's see, let's put pictures to these concepts for a better understanding. A view volume, we sometimes call it frustum. That's why this term is here. View frustum calling is the removal of geometry entirely outside the viewing volume. So the red circle here and this one, it just gets called out. The yellow, it is not culling, this is called clipping. So what we will do here is we will clip this yellow uh, object and just show the visible part. But here we don't call this clipping, we just call, call this, remove this entirely. Uh, there is no open class support for that, for the view volume culling. Okay, so it is your responsibility to uh, Call what is outside. So if you uh, detect that this, that part, maybe you are running an animation and that part is not within the, your camera view volume, then you shouldn't be applying simulation to that uh, guy, or maybe you should still apply simulation to make, make it come back to your scene. So it is wrong, but you should definitely not be applying some rendering to that guy because it won't be seen anyway. But you will still be performing uh, the forces that may later put this inside. So this is not completely ignored from your program just because it is not inside at a given time, but it is not going to be rendered. This is all about rendering. So how to detect uh, the stuff that are out of your viewing volume? So you should know your viewing volume defined by six planes. It is a box uh, and you have access to these planes thanks to your near, far, uh, and bottom, top, and left, right parameters you set in the open trial in the beginning. Uh, and so then the thing is we again go to our old friend dot product here. Uh, assume that this is your viewing area, okay? Like 
is four lines, uh, not planes, but lines. So, but the idea goes like this. If this is your query point P, take any point on this line or plane that we call A and define this vector from A to P, okay? And take the scalar projection of this on this unit direction N, it will give you this value. And this value is positive, be careful. If P is outside of this area, viewing area, then this value will be positive. And if it is positive for even one lines or one of the four lines or one of the six planes, then it means that this part, this point is outside. So only one is enough, okay, if any. Uh, that is important and logical also. Uh, so for each point you do this, and if it is, if uh, the points are all outside, then it means that all these objects are is outside. So you call it. You don't uh, draw it, render it. But again, testing all the points on the vertex may be too costly because there may be millions of objects. So we first actually uh, put a bounding box or bounding sphere over our million vertex complex model. And we do this test with the bounding box or bounding sphere or another bounding proximity uh, proxy of that object, which will have less amount of points. Yeah, so that would be the weaving volume, view volume culling. Back face culling is uh, uh, culling where I have, we have support from OpenGL. So unlike the view volume calling where OpenGL doesn't do anything for you, uh, in the back face calling, you just enable call face and then you just call GL back uh, using GL call face function. Then what it does is in this bunny, for instance, the triangles that are back uh, facing, which will be, uh, currently in like we can't see it so I don't know how to describe it but like in the back side of this bunny will not be rendered at all they won't be processed through our GPU shaders at all uh, fragment shader at all uh, so for closed polygon by the way this is a problem because if the polygon is not closed like this then the back faces are still informative actually. You don't want to, you still want to render them, even if they will be rendered by their backside, so it will be black, but it still gives you an idea about the shape. But for a closed polygon model like this bunny, you will definitely not be getting any information from those back faces. So for closed polygon models, back facing polygons are guaranteed to be occluded by front-facing polygons. Here, not no guarantee. And actually, although some of the back-facing polygons, like the ones on the back of this point, are covered, uh, occluded by the by this front-facing forehead uh, faces, uh, primitives, some parts may not be occluded. But if it is a closed polygon model, all the uh, all the back facing polygons must be, will be occluded, guaranteed. Uh, so then why do we need to, why do we render them at all? Uh, so back face calling the algorithm to understand whether a face is back facing or not is as follows. So this is your triangle. So is it front facing or back facing? So if this is your eye, this is front facing, right? Because your eye sees the front of this triangle. So how to detect this? Again, good old friend dot product, you uh, define your viewing vector by V, which runs from your camera to the point on the triangle or uh, yeah, on, on the polygon or the primitive. Actually, primitive is a general word, like line is also a primitive, but you need some area here. So I talk about triangle here. Anyway, V, when you take the dot product of this V, 
with the unit direction n, it will, so it, it, this is the back of n, so it will have this projection, so there will be this value, some non-zero value, but more importantly, this value will be negative because it is looking at the opposite side of n. This is the true side of n. So if this is negative, then I am good. Then I have a front-facing triangle. So I will feed it to my fragment shader, pixel shader. However, if the V, and if you dot it to this uh, unit direction, you will have this value, which is a positive value because it runs uh, with the correct orientation of this normal. So if it is positive, then this is the back of the face that I am looking at. So let's not draw it at all. Let's not even try to find the front face colors. So the back face color will be black if you use your ray tracing because of your cosine term. So it will be black anyway, but why do you even calculate it? Uh, and again, the front face, you shouldn't even attempt to calculate those colors. But without the back face color, you would attempt because your shader has no information about it. Uh, it will use this normal and uh, if you are implementing funk shading, it will be also using this vector V uh, and there will be some light here. So maybe this is your light. Uh, and so for the, for the term here, cosine term will disable the term due to the viewing vector. So it will be the specular highlight term. It won't be seen, okay, but unfortunately the, the, the diffusion term, which has uh, nothing to do with V, diffusion, remember, it has this light vector versus your N vector, and they all look good. So you really calculate some diffusion term here for a pixel that will not be seen anyway. Uh, yes, okay. Then, and finally, we have this occlusion culling, the removal of geometry that is uh, within the V volume, inside the V volume, but it is occluded by some other geometry that is closer to the camera. Like in this example, both red and blue triangles are inside, uh, but actually, unfortunately, some part of the red will not be seen by this eye because something is between the eye and the, that part of the uh, triangle. So to do occlusion culling, you can use your painter's algorithm, the oldest solution. In this case, you do some pre-processing and order your objects from back to front. Like this is the one, first one in order, second and third, and then in the render time, apply that ordering. So first draw this blue, okay? Then draw the yellow, then draw the green. So it will automatically write over the yellow stuff. But the obvious problem with Painter's algorithm is that sometimes the ordering is ambiguous, like in this scenario, which one is uh, the number one, right? So, so consider very large objects here. So even though these are like just triangles, but this is like maybe a human model, it's a car model, etc. And some part of the human may be in front of the car, right? So there is no simple integer ordering to that. So it is just not feasible to apply this algorithm. The most popular and most stable algorithm is the Z buffer algorithm. In this case, I don't use ordering. I just use depth, depth information. So every 3D object after the model view transformations and the viewing transformations, they land to this frame buffer with their X, Y coordinates. Okay, so that would be your frame buffer. Uh, <clears throat> you put uh, the color, whatever the color is, uh, to the corresponding entry in this 2D frame buffer array. Uh, and then there is also a separate independent Z buffer. Remember, I have begun 
with the three with three components x y z. So after all these weaving transformations, I still have some z value in my hand. So that z value goes to this z buffer. It will be within zero and one, and zero means uh, this its distance to the camera. So zero means front, one means back. Uh, so for instance, this yellow pixel that I can't see here currently, it lands here, okay, with zero point four. But f first let's draw the green box, okay? So there is no order. So this green pixel lands here with uh, 0 0.2 of depth value. Then later on, when I draw the yellow box and this invisible point of yellow box, I want to draw it at the same location, but I already have 0 0.2 for the corresponding Z buffer location and the corresponding Z value for the yellow pixel is 0 0.2. 45, which is bigger than 0 0.2. So you will keep 0 0.2 and associated color uh, green. So even though you draw yellow after green, so you don't care about any ordering, you will still survive. Uh, your green pixel is, will still survive. And that is what we want. Uh, yeah. And uh, there is also Z calling that can be supported by OpenGL, which is a little bit advanced for this uh, class. That's why I, I won't talk about that. I will leave it at the Z buffer uh, algorithm, which is a very important algorithm in computer graphics anyway. So this is a good place to stop then. Uh, I will uh, see you next week.